And it was funny, I sat there in my home in Portugal, and when they gave me the news, my wife was very distraught, and, I, and maybe I shed a tear, but I just, for one second I realized, hey, what I've done in my life, and at that stage, 57 years old, no, not many people have done it in their two or three lifetimes. So I didn't even worry. I thought, gee, I've done enough. Hey guys, before this episode of Legends with Bevo, just excited to announce we've got a collaboration with Yubi at the moment, and we're giving away some awesome gift packs for FC Barcelona fans. Looking in here, ooh, some pretty fancy shorts. They look absolutely fantastic. And it's so easy, all you need to do is jump on Instagram, share your favorite ever FC Barcelona moment, and you never know, you could be a lucky winner. Well, what a pleasure it is once again to have Oscar Chalupski on Sports Legends with Bevo. Now, Big O, last time we found you in Portugal, you're over there in Cape Town. Uh, tell us all about that, uh, how it's all going, and, and how life's treating you. Well, it's actually going very well. I've just finished my first set of chemo, so I ended up having the chemo here, which avoids me flying back to Portugal to have it there. So it's just two injections, one on a Friday, one on a Monday. And then, as you know, I always fast before that. So on Friday, I'll have it again. So I'll fast from now until Friday. And then I'll carry on fasting for the next injection on Monday. And then it's all over for another three months. And in between that, I'm going to be doing the famous Miller's Run. And funny enough, the wind, you can't tell now, but because I'm in a protected place, the wind's blowing over 30 knots. And I hope to do a nice downwind this afternoon, maybe even two. So South Africa at this time of the year, especially Cape Town, has got huge winds. So it's a lot of fun getting a little bit fit and, and building up to my 60th birthday. So I am getting old on the 1st of March. Wow, 60 years old. You certainly don't look at it all, mate. Tell us about the Miller's Run. What that, what's that all about? It's about a 12-kilometer run from a place called Miller's Point to Fishhook. And, and in between there, you've got the Roman Rock Lighthouse or the, or the Simonstown Lighthouse. And the other day, I actually went through at 35 knots. And it's a little gap about this wide, just enough to surf ski can go through. And I went through that. Now, a lot of people are trying to do that as well. But it's a lot of fun. It's a huge wind. As I say, it's a very tame and, and the swell is not so big, but the wind howls. I mean, the swell can be two or three meters, not very big, but the wind blows 30, 35, 40 knots, which is a lot of fun. And that's where I really have a thrill, you know, Do, going downwind is my, is my forte. And, and that's where my skill level comes in a lot, you know. And you're a, you're a 12-time world champion surf skier. You won your 12th title at the ripe age of 49 as well, mate. We'll, we'll get to the battles you've been through since uh, getting bone cancer in late 2019 in a moment, but uh, I don't, honestly don't know how you do it. Uh, you're still competing even after all those challenges. What keeps you driven and keeps you going even after someone telling you they only had six months to live back in late 2019? Well, um, the most important thing as well is I didn't realise through all those trials and tribulations to all the races that it actually geared me up for this battle to fight against cancer. And I think one of the most important fights that you've got to do and what you've got to do in this fight is to be fit. And there's nothing better than me paddling and cycling and swimming and having all this fun. So that's one of the things. And, and the reason why I train so hard is that I can eat and drink more and don't get too fat. You see, that's that's another thing to do. So I love life. Uh, I uh, live life to the fullest, which is important because you never know when you get the six months call and say, listen, what have you done? In fact, 10 o'clock, I'm going to a school. I'm doing a talk at a, at, a, at a township school in Ottery in Cape Town. As you know, there's a unemployment rate in South Africa, about 40 percent. And, and a lot of people live in these townships and these shacks. And I'm going to go and give a talk at one of the schools. So, again, and, and the most important thing that I'm going to bring across to these kids is that, remember, live every day. And if you're going to do anything, do it properly. Don't just humble along life and, and try and cut corners all the time. Try to do your best, you know, and, and I think that's why I love competing still. My wife gets mad that I said, oh, I'm going to race this race and I'm going to go to the Molokka. This year it's the Sean Partners Molokka, which is an Australian company sponsoring uh, the Molokka race in, in Hawaii. Unbelievable, mate. I love your drive. You're, you know, in, absolutely inspiring for sure. And uh, I'm sure so many people listening and watching would agree to that. Now, back in late 2019, you got a diagnosis of having bone cancer. You were told you only had six months to live. And you're still here today. You're still playing golf. You're still competing. What was it like, though, when you first found out that? And your attitude is just phenomenal, O. But how did you get over those challenges And you know, when you first found out that terrible news? Well, it was funny. It was on the 25th of November, 2019. The reason why I remember that date, because on the 26th of November, my wife turned 60. 
And I'd organized a surprise party. The only surprise she got is that I, I had cancer. So that wasn't a, a great surprise. And it was funny. I sat there in my home in Portugal. And when they gave me the news, my wife was very distraught. And, I, and maybe I shed a tear. But I just, for one second, I realized, hey, what I've done in my life, and at that stage, 57 years old, no, not many people have done it in their two or three lifetimes. So I didn't even worry. I thought, she, I've done enough. And that's what I, what I went into the cancer. Yes, they gave me six months. I didn't care. In fact, on the 29th of November, I phoned um, my friend Graham Spence, this guy here, the, the, my co-author. And I said, listen, Graham, you won't believe it. In this ad, like I'm speaking to you, you won't believe it. I've got cancer. And he was like shocked. I said, no, it's no problem. I've got six months to live. We've got plenty of time to write this book. And then he said to me on the train, and I said, Oscar, I've got a small problem. I've got a deadline. I can't just uh, drop this jet deadline. I said, don't worry. I will still be here longer than six months. Believe you me. And I'm here still in uh, 2023. <laughs> so good. And uh, your book, No Retreat, No Surrender, you've, you've just uh, got it there. And it's also a great movie as well, yeah. mind you, back in the day, one of my favorite movies as a child. But uh, <laughs> tell us about the idea behind the book. And obviously, you don't want to give too much away, but give us a bit of a understanding what it's all about and what made you write the book. Well, the, the first thing happened is I would never have written a book. I mean, there's too many sportsmen that have that got far more accolades than I have. And I thought, no, no, I'm going to write a book that's going to help other people. So after each chapter, there's life lessons, lessons, mistakes that I've made and the mistakes that I've made so that nobody else makes it. So I teach people through this book. So it's sort of a self-help book and it's a sort of a biography, but the most important thing I wanted to do is help other people. And believe me, I get hundreds of requests. Oh, this guy's just got cancer. Please, can you sign a book? So the book has been out there for uh, just under five months and people are loving it and giving it as gifts for people going through tough times. And that was the whole objective. I, I didn't want to write a book. And, and Graham Spence, my, my fellow uh, co-author, did a magnificent uh, job conveying and helping other people. I mean, I've also had people that have read this book two or three times. It becomes their little guideline, you know, and they're writing notes on it. And that's what the book was about. It wasn't about blowing smoke up my ass to say, oh, how good I was. It's nothing to do with that. It's there to help people. I never was a professional sportsman, never, ever. I never could wake up in the morning and say, oh, today, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to go and train. No. I used to have to wake up, train, and then go to work. That's why everybody can do what I've done. I was a completely normal person, maybe a little bit more talented and more driven than other people, but that you can do. You can train yourself to be better. And that's what I try and uh, express and try and teach other people to do is that they can all do better than they think they can. I can't wait to have a read of the book, mate. It's going to be an absolute beauty. And, and where can people buy it? And is it available as an audio book as well? Yes, in the audiobook uh, version from Amazon and, and Audible, uh, we did something different there. I put, put a lot of animation. So when I'm paddling and hear the water and then after before the life lessons, I'd, I've got like Hawaiian drums playing so that it wakes you up in case you're sleeping through my book. And then it tells you, and then I, I talk. So I've got a narrator and myself, the two of us narrate the book. And, and people have had, again, I've had rave reviews. If you go and look, my reviews on Amazon are about five or 4.9. One guy said it was a... A one, one out of a few, so that happens. But mostly, ninety-nine percent of the people love the book and love the, what it's there for. It's to inspire people and to help people overcome the odds. Yeah, I can't see anyone not loving it. I'm sure it's going to be an absolute ripper. I can't wait to have a read, as I said, or listen, sorry, <laughs> which I like to do these days. I think audio books seem to be the way to go, just a bit easier. <laughs> now let's I go agree, back. I agree. When we're driving around, driving around, I just did a whole road trip around South Africa teaching. People started in Cape Town. I went all the way along up to Durban, then to Johannesburg, then the Underberg, then Bloemfontein, of all places where there's not much water, then Grafrenet, then Fancourt, all the way to Robinson with the Berg River, and then back to Cape Town. It was a whole month trip teaching and, and teaching paddling and telling people about the book and trying to help people out there, you know. And let's go back to your journey, O. When did you first start getting into, you know, surf skiing? Was it through your father or mother or someone... You know, someone else? Yeah, my father came out of Germany. He's a German, so he came out of Mannheim. And, and when they called, he, he went through the war. He was born in 1937. He paddles every day, and he's 85 and, and paddles 12 or 15 kilometers every day, cycles, swims, runs. So he's like a normal 50-year-old, but he's 85. And, and he's going to come to Australia for the World Surf Ski Championships uh, in Perth uh, in next year, November. 
So he started us paddling, but funny enough, and this is a very important lesson for parents, is that he never pushed us into paddling. So I was a swimmer, water polo, tennis, cricket. He didn't say, hey, go and pa come paddle like me, you know. And eventually, when I was like 12 or 10 or 11, said, don't you want to paddling? I said, oh, okay, well, let's go and do a bit of paddling. And that's how it all started. I paddled in Durban Harbour with him, and I got fast very quickly because I was much taller than everybody and bigger than everybody. So I was had an advantage on size, but you don't realize uh, he actually set me a goal. I wanted a racing bike, never forget. I wanted a racing bike. And he said, no, no, you don't get a racing bike. You have to win the Nipper Ironman. And in Australia, you all know the Nipper Ironman is not a ski. It's a, a swim board and, 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 and boogie board, you know, so Malibu board and a boogie board. That's the Nipper Ironman. And I had to win the South African and he would buy me a bike. And then I got beaten in the Natal in the state championships. And I thought, gee whiz. Because I used to win everything because I was so big. But I realized that even small people have got a determination to beat big people like me. So from that day on, I started training. My father never pushed us. He just said he provided the platform. And that's important. He provided the plan. You do what you like. If you wanted to wake up in the morning and go swimming, he was there for you. But if you slept in, he didn't care. But you knew that if you didn't train hard, you wouldn't win. And that's what he instilled. If you're going to do something, being a German precision, you do it properly, no matter what it is. That's wonderful advice. And have you used that same advice as well with your own kids? And have they sort of gone on to to compete in the same sport or or some you know, other aspects of of life as well? Oh, yes, exactly. I mean, my son basically made the national team paddling, but again, never forced him to do it. Again, just encouraged him, coached him, and he he did very well. But then he didn't. And in the other sport, he was very good at golf. And again, he left it. I didn't push him, and and he had and he's got a tremendous talent in golf but he didn't I didn't uh, make him uh, do anything that that he didn't want to do so you've got to give them encouragement but they've got to choose their direction the biggest problem with parenting is that you want to sort of live your life through your kids and that's not very good I, I suggest that you let them flourish at what they want to do and just give them guidance I mean I, and, that, and my father did that very well Again, that's really good advice because you see so often that parents can just be pushing their kids to the to that stage where the kids don't even want to do that sport anymore. And, you know, and I mean, obviously you want to encourage them and if they've got talent, do whatever you can to, to help them to fulfill that talent. But at the same time, you don't want to push them away from the sport. So that's, that's really good advice. Yeah. I mean, I think that's something that every parent should learn is that, and, they, and that in South Africa, they call them helicopter parents and things like that. And they, don't, they don't even realize what they're doing. You know, get, they're getting too involved. My parents never got involved at all in our school sports or anything like that. You did it, you achieved by yourself with their encouragement. And I think that's important. And looking back at your career as well, what's been some of your favorite favorite moments during your career, Oh, and why? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a funny thing because it's been such a long time. I mean, the, the, when I first became famous is when I won junior and senior Ironman and went at, in national junior and senior Ironman at age 16. And then Grant Kenny, one month later, did it in Australia, junior and senior Ironman. And Grant and I have been friends since then. And then... I wanted to race Grant Kenny, but because of apartheid, people don't realize we couldn't race and compete anywhere, nor could uh, Grant come. So Grant went to Olympics and did that. We couldn't do that. But in 1983, I knew he was going to go to the Molokai, and I raced him in Molokai in 1983, the first time I actually met this guy that had, had also won junior and senior Ironman. And in 1983, he had already won four Molokais in a row, and then I raced him in, in 83 for the first time, and I managed to beat him. So... There's been a long rivalry. And funny enough, I won that Molokai race seven years in a row from 83 all the way to 90 and won that seven. And then I got banned again. They wouldn't let me race again. So they kicked me out. And that's when I took up golf and I, and I loved the sport and, and, and met very nice people. And I went, so I went from something doing the water into the land. And by the end of the year, I went from 24 to a, a scratch handicap. Gee whiz, you've certainly got some sporting talent there. That's for sure. <laughs> And in terms of your your favorite places to compete, where where they been? Oh, and why? Well, you know the funny thing is, any place that's got wind and waves and beautiful sun is going to be magnificent. I mean, I've raced in Tahiti and Hawaii. My my wife's favorite place is Hawaii, and I really like Hawaii because I've won there twelve times. Uh, but again, uh, racing down the river in Spain, the biggest race in the world, the Sela Descent, and Herman and I won that in nineteen eighty six. And and funny enough, in nineteen eighty seven. Raman Anderson from Perth and John Jacoby from Adelaide won the setter and we came second. But 
all these places are all magnificent because you are in and with nature. And that's the nice thing about sport, especially our sport, you in the open, having fun. And if there's wind, I mean, Tahiti is magnificent. Guadalupe's magnificent. Porto's make anywhere where you're out there and there's big winds, big waves, and obviously Cape Town where I'm here with, with the big wind and, and waves. I love it, you know. So there's no specific, this is the absolute best, but Hawaii, it'll be a long way to beat Hawaii and Tahiti. And back in 1992, you did something really proud. You competed for your nation at the Barcelona Olympics. Tell us about that experience and what it was like to, you know, compete for your country and, and represent South Africa after all those challenges that you've been through over those years. Yeah, so it is interesting that we never, so my father actually relinquished his German passport to make the South African team to go to the Olympics and they were banned. So he gave his, his German passport up for a South African one. And by the way, he still can't get it back. We've all got German passports by my father. No way, they won't give it back to him. So what happened, I went from, and it was interesting, when Nelson Mandela got released, they straight away said, oh, we'll be going to the Olympics. And remember, I was playing golf. So my friend Pierre Stratum said, no, 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 Oscar, you've got to start training. We're definitely going to the Olympics. And I said, okay, because in 86, I tried for the German national team, got very close, but no cigar. And then this time I said, okay, this time I'll make that team. And lo and behold, I made it, met Nelson Mandela, fantastic guy. And basically he paved the way for the future of South Africa after apartheid and did a magnificent job at, at, at sort of the transition. And he was a really nice guy. He was an ex-boxer, so he knew about sport. And he, he knows that sport unified. And uh, we went there and I happened to be the spokesman for the whole South African team. We went there and again, we only got one and a half years to train. So we got proper curvature of the earth. So we didn't do very well. We made the semifinals, but I don't go I don't go anywhere just to compete. I go there to win and I didn't win. And from that day on 1992, I changed my whole training technique using my own skills and racing against people like in that year, Clint Robinson from Australia. You might have heard of him. Yeah. He won the thousand meter medal. Yeah. And that was in 1992. And funny in 2012, so that many years later, using my own own techniques in 2012, racing the Molokai, lo and behold, the guy came second by 12 seconds was none other than Clint Robinson. In 2012, I won at 49. Clint Robinson was 12 seconds behind, over three hours, 23 minutes. Yeah, because he used to compete. We had back here in Australia the Uncle Toby Super Series back in the day with Guy Leach and Grant Kenny, as you mentioned, Trevor Hendy, and, and Clint Robinson used to compete in that. He, he did always really well in the, the surf, ski, and board, but I don't reckon he was much for a runner and swimmer. <laughs> no, he's probably not a bad runner, but he's not a good swimmer. So Leachy obviously had lots of competition with him. I was in the Nutrigrain Series not, uh, in 1986. I was there racing under German flag against Grant and, and Leachy and Hendy and the Mercer brothers. So those are all my era, and I raced against them and had a lot of fun in Australia, but the runs killed me. I, I wasn't bad on board, ski, and, and swimming, but the run in the soft sand, that killed me because I was much bigger than all those guys. I mean, I was weighing 95 kilograms, and they were 75 kilograms, which makes a big difference in uh, running along the sand, soft sand especially. Oh, yeah, it's very tough. <laughs> and, and 1992, I know obviously your kids would have been pretty young back then, but uh, must have been a pretty proud moment as well being a father and them seeing their dad competing for South Africa on the world's biggest stage. Yeah, it was tough. I mean, the funny thing is the Olympics is all, uh, it's all a nice thing to go there, but the sacrifices you have to make to go there. So I had to move out of my house. I had to give up my job so to try and train and did working and paddling in between. And then I was, I was living in Durban, but I had the, the, the training camps were all in Joburg. So I used to leave for three months, go and do a training camp, try and make some money, money in between, raise money because South Africa hasn't got big uh, coffers for sport. Yeah, none, none, none at all. And especially in 92, there was nothing. So you had to raise all your own money, try and live off uh, a shoestring. And that's what happens when you, you're trying to be the best. So yes, my son was very young. He was only one or two years old and my daughter was on the way just after the Olympics. Talking to some of my South Australian mates here that are involved in surf lifesaving, I hear that you can actually chug some beers uh, pretty quickly and you even used to do it before competition and you beat them as well. Though. Tell us more about that. <laughs> well, I'm out in my old, uh, I used to drink at least a dozen beers before the Monica. In fact, it's, it was like a urban legend that oh, there's some Hawaiians came and said, oh, the one way we're going to beat Oscar is by giving him lots of beers. So 
I had the 12 beers, they had one or two. And the next day I went out and beat them. But now that they've stopped me now because I had atrial fibrillation, which is a palpitation of the heart. And they jump started me and they said, no, 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 you can't drink before a race. So nowadays I don't drink two or three days before a big race. Uh, but afterwards I climb in and I still do the same after my chemo. I'm going to have my chemo on Friday. And once I've had my chemo, I'll be into the drinks again. <laughs> I love it. Well, Big O, before we go, just another big shout out for your book again, No Retreat, No Surrender. Where can people buy it? <laughs> yeah, it's on, on, it's on uh, Amazon and it's on all the, the digital formats. And then some of the guys can get the paperback out, the paperback. And the interesting thing about this book is that is that I've also, a portion of my royalties go to think called Campaigning for Cancer, which is a non-profit organization, because my goal in life now is to uh, live long enough so they can find a cure for bone marrow cancer. So that's why I'm giving money back to Campaigning for Cancer so that they can find and re- spend money on research to find a cure so that I can live uh, longer and we can do more chats, Beva, and I can do more Molokas and get to the age of my old man at 85 and still be racing against everybody. And hopefully have a beer in Adelaide as well one day. Yeah, we would. I mean, I, I, I didn't go this time, but I'll definitely come maybe in, in the November, December this year, at the end of the year, and we'll have a beer, 100%. Maybe a bit of wine. Beer makes you too fat. Yeah, <laughs> wine sounds great. <laughs> well, Oscar Chalapsky, thanks. And you've got good for- Adelaide wine. Great. Oh. Hey, you've got great wines in there. Yeah, oh, we do. Absolutely. It's, we're very, very fortunate here in Adelaide, that's for sure. So, <laughs> well, Oscar Chalupsky, thanks fun. so much for joining us on Sports Legends with Bevo. Again, congratulations on the book, No Retreat, No Surrender. And you're a true, a true warrior, inspiring. The list goes on. There's so many words that we could use for you because of, you know, the challenges that you've overcome. And you're still smiling, you're still competing, you're still enjoying life. Keep up the great work, mate. We'll speak again soon. <laughs>